Begin recording for Project Frostbite. This is Nikolai Tinsel, Administrator for the Santana Forge. I will be leading the Rapid Response Task Force, Team Frostbite, for a short notice build project with a critical delivery date. The Royal Archive has uncovered an ancient recipe for a viscoelastic medium, notable for its continual use in cold weather conditions, a true gift from the past. Our elite team of Engineering and Logistics Fabricators, or ELFs, has been meticulously analyzing the properties of this unique material and preparing to work with it. The Omnitech Research Group promptly drafted a potential mech for deployment in nuclear winter wastelands. As a result, Santana's forge has been tasked with bringing this sculpture to life. Project Frostbite sets out to deliver an innovative design that pushes the boundaries of imagination and engineering, achieving something entirely unprecedented. The composite begins with a glutenin matrix, combined with cinnamaldehyde, eugenol, and sodium chloride, in preparation for stirring into a thick, tar-like substance. Butanoic acid is retrieved from deep freeze storage and brought to standard working temperature. The solvent is prepared in an industrial mixer from a hydrolyzing disaccharide, a tarry humectant plasticizer, and butanoic acid for increased ease of manufacturing. Not all mixers have the same specifications, so we experimented with three different mixing attachments to see what would work the best. An aqueous albumin solution was incorporated as a binder and emulsifier for the composite. We exchanged the mixer head for a sturdier paddle that could handle incorporation of the glutenin mixture. Doing this in batches allowed us to see that the paddle would not last until the end of the process, so it was swapped for a large singular hook. Make sure to scrape down unmixed material around the outside, around the outside, around the outside. Although this worked well and ultimately became our tool of choice, it still needed manual refinement from the ELFs to achieve homogeneity. Preparing the polymer for shaping presented its own set of challenges. Precision rollers, adjustable to specific thicknesses, are indispensable for achieving the level of accuracy demanded by this mech build. From hours of practice, we found a few key tips that may help others. Try to keep the material cool by keeping it in a refrigerator, not a blast chiller. This helps with both cutting and shaping by reducing adhesion. A blade with the narrowest surface area will cut the best, but even better is to produce cutters specifically for each component. Once the components are carefully shaped, they are transferred to a gas furnace, hot enough to roast chestnuts, where the thermosetting process transforms them into a solid and highly durable form. If using a cutter, apply pressure with a hydraulic press, then place the form upside down onto a tray for easier extraction. We made an excessive number of duplicates, so the extras will be sent to the Omni Waste Reclamation District for recycling. The cutters warped after washing, highlighting the need for durable options like aluminum or stainless steel. For such precision parts, PCBWay, known for their high-quality 3D printing, PCB prototyping, and custom manufacturing, offers services that even Santana's ELFs might envy. Their Christmas sale, up to 50% off until December 31st, is a timely opportunity for those looking to gift themselves some tailored components. 
This is not a metallic material, so a special cement must be prepared from aqueous albumin, but with the vitelligenins removed. Alpha-D-glucopyranosol 1,2-beta-D-fructofuranoside is stabilized with potassium bitartrate before adding the albumin. This is what the mixture looks like directly from the recipe, which we found too difficult to apply, although it was very stable in welding parts together. Excitedly, with all the components ready for assembly, we moved forward with Project Frostbite. The material has a tendency to warp, and we did not find a perfect solution to resolve this. This recording serves as an audit of our team's findings, not a step-by-step -step guide. But supplementary materials, including a video and written manual, are provided in the notes. The fix cement was hard to apply, and closing gaps took much effort, which was not a jolly good time. As a result, the dimensions were thrown askew, so design improvisation was necessary during the build. Thankfully, the cement worked like a plaster that was capable of filling gaps and solidifying assemblies. The first leg assembled taught us much about the final state of the solidified polymer and how many dimensions would need to be fixed. The material felt almost as strong as fruit cake during construction. Adjustments were ground into the feet, and in no time we managed to have two self-balancing legs constructed. We needed a new batch of cement, and this time we added several drops of universal solvent, which significantly aided in application and assembly of the components. The lower viscosity was easier to dispense, and it was easier to close gaps between mating surfaces, but they were also more prone to shifting before the cement was fully cured. The torso was starting to become incredibly heavy, and I was concerned about the strength of the legs, but Santana's forge always delivers, and we would make it work. The specialized cold weather missile launchers were not as complicated to assemble as I anticipated. In fact, it might have been helpful to design the torso in a similar manner. Perhaps we will consider an alternate design for some time in the future. The crossbeam supporting the weaponry and the torso is a critical component that needed to be fine-tuned. This strange polymer took some experimenting to find an optimal tool for shaping it. The dimensional accuracy was so poor that the obvious alignments in the design weren't there, leading us to installing the crossbeam backwards. The cross beam was fine-tuned with grinders and saws until the missile launchers could fit comfortably against the frame. Installation of the first missile launcher officially makes Frostbite a combat mech, but there is still much work to be done. For instance, the cross beam was too long on each side, which didn't allow the cannon mounts to sit flush at their intended position. An assembly platform was built specifically for this mech to make construction and analysis significantly easier. After much deliberation, the team decided to attach both sides of the pelvis simultaneously before attaching the feet. 
After filling gaps, both feet were attached simultaneously and a level was used to determine that the facility is actually crooked and should not be trusted. The center of mass of the torso deviated slightly from the model designed by the Omutech Research Group, but overall, they did a fantastic job in the structural ability of frostbite. Per the Royal Archive notes, it appears that the cement can also be used as a surface finisher, so we attempted to use this as a sort of primer and thermal insulator for the machine. It behaves like a non-Newtonian fluid, so it is suggested that spreading the substance is done with small, short movements to avoid a tearing phenomenon that can occur. The surface also starts to set immediately, and if moving slowly, it can be challenging to evenly coat the subject if too much is applied. Less than a drop of universal solvent can help blend some of the drier surfaces, but this will still lead to a poor surface finish. It is recommended to use a fine dispenser and pipe for cement in parallel applications. Whiteout conditions in the field pose a serious risk of losing visual contact, so the mech was saturated in a bold red finish to ensure it stood out against the endless snowdrifts. At last, we can turn our attention to the intricate bits and bobbles that make up the armaments. The ELFs worked tirelessly to produce several functional designs on such short notice, but with more time and planning, unconfident we, and others, could craft a vast array of intricate and remarkable mechanisms. For frostbite, we started with the primary autocannons, semi-automatic 120mm smoothbore twin barrels for each arm. Secondary machine guns for the cockpit were precision machined and assembled, featuring integrated pivoting aim assist in the pitch direction. To help protect surfaces against potential oxidation from constant contact with snow, we decided to anodize a protective layer over most of the functional parts installed. Joints were reinforced with bearing end caps that could be removed within a facility for easier joint maintenance. Although it will be cold, excess heat may still need to be purged through proper ventilation. Frostbite still needs mobility, so secondary pistons were installed on the fronts of the feet, while large primary pistons were installed on the backs of the legs to aid in the ambulation. With legs this robust, the next movement should be as resilient and graceful as a reindeer on a winter trek. The missile launchers were the simplest, as most of the complexity is within the missiles themselves. We merely needed to make covers for each of the missile tubes. The primary autocannons still needed their 120mm ammunition belts created and installed to become functional. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the mech's gunfire will be so delightful. The cockpit gets a specialized windscreen, which can melt off any accumulated ice sheets. We still had a bit of time left on the clock, so we incorporated some spare rivets onto the heaviest panels of armor. Lastly, a long-distance communications array was installed to maintain data transmissions back to the Omniplex.
This has been a joyous project to work on, and I hope this has been encouraging to any other researchers out there. Everyone supporting the Royal Archive has made it onto my nice list. Merry Christmas. I'll see you next year.